Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Skylar Town. Uh, my talk, obviously, is going to be on lock sport as an emerging subculture. Uh, I was going to be handing out some things this morning. Uh, in an ironic but not uncommon twist, I locked myself out of the hotel room this morning. <laughs> Uh, so, after the talk, after the q and I'm going to swing back over to uh, the Circus Circus Motel. And uh, I'm going to set myself up in the contest area at the table. Feel free to swing by. I'll have some locks there, some picks, and uh, some CDs with pinning charts and uh, copies of a magazine that we just launched uh, yesterday. Uh, all right. So, on to the talk. I'm nervous as heck. All right. Lock sport. In the introduction here, I'm going to talk quickly, just a little bit of background on the history of locks and a little bit of a background on the history of lock pickers uh, in their various forms. Uh, a lot of this in many ways was kind of hacking before the electron. Uh, we're uh, very intertwined with the hacker community and hopefully I will get to express some of that. The modern pin tumbler lock is based on an ancient design, a, uh, the Egyptian pin tumbler lock. Uh, the, uh, it was really what is on your door today has been around for two, three thousand years. Uh, the only difference is that back then it was operated by gravity, now it's operated by a spring. Um, there of course have been many advances beyond that and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, in medieval times, uh, locks took on an artistic form. Locks were primarily one-offs for the better part of history. Uh, you would build them for your specific security need. You would, in turn, build them to meet your artistic and aesthetic uh, specifications as well. Castles would have, you know, coats of arms. They would have their own key. Uh... Now, why aren't you guys doing that? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll continue through the history here. I got better stuff coming. Uh, so <laughs> So uh, anyway, just continuing the theme of one-offs. Uh, one-offs were, for the better, again, for the better part of history, security through obscurity and physical security was the norm. You were building your lock for your specific purpose, and because you were getting one of them built and you were having one guy build it, there weren't many people that were going to know what was going on inside except for you and him and whoever you were given a key to. Uh, this went a step further when the artistic warded locks had some fairly easy defeats uh, that came up with, uh, which I'll cover in the lock, uh, the lock picker section, uh, and puzzle locks started coming around. These are basically a normal lock, and then the keyhole is fake, and you got to find the keyhole by moving a slot. Uh, I mean, it's Indiana Jones stuff, you know, only on smaller metal scale. Uh, all right, modern advances. The pin tumbler sidebar, this is my favorite, it's uh, because I love the pin tumbler lock, it's what we primarily use in America, and I'm a patriot. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's a quick picture for you, this is the Schlage Primus with a sidebar. Uh, those of you who understand the basic function of a lock, the top section of this looks very normal to you most likely. Uh, now the section on the right hand side, that's the sidebar and the bits dropping down below. Those are small finger pins and the way this operates is uh, the finger pins have to be lifted and rotated into position so that the small teeth of the sidebar, which I'm sure are a little bit hard to see right now, can press into those. Once that sidebar can press in, the cylinder can turn freely. Uh, with a dual locking mechanism like that and with a sidebar locking mechanism in general, the pin tumbler took a huge leap forward and actually became uh, a, a fairly secure lock. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously as, as any lock supporter will tell you, uh, most locks aren't 100% secure. Uh, all right, the wafer lock. Uh, wafer locks are interesting. They're not all that secure. They're great for hard weather situations. It's a different system. Uh, it's not something that I'm going to cover here, but if you're interested, one of the other four main types of modern locks is a wafer lock. The disc lock is awesome. Uh, the disc lock is uh, in its best and its most modern forms the closest thing to an unpickable lock, uh, an, unpickable, an unpickable mechanical lock that I think you can get. 
Um, look up the S Abloy company. Basically, they operate like a safe would. They operate like a safe that you manipulate with a key. Uh, the really beautiful concept. And then the lever lock. The lever lock actually uh, not terribly modern. It's been around for an extraordinarily long time. It's primarily used over in England and uh, uh, Europe in general. Uh, again, a great system. And the nice thing about all of the locks up on the board there, well, aside from some pin tumbler locks with sidebars, uh, they are bump proof. And we'll get into bumping later. And bumping is just such a stupid and very powerful phenomenon. Uh, all right, on to the lock pickers. Pre-locks. Before locks existed, I said, you know, this is kind of like hacking before the electron. Well, back before there were locks, uh, sailors oftentimes would tie themselves a thief knot. Basically what this was was a square knot only tied slightly differently. That way they could detect if someone had surreptitiously untied their knot uh, and tied it back together. Because when the person ties it back together, they're just going to tie a square knot after they've rummaged through your things. Uh, this is just one of the earliest forms of detecting surreptitious entry and why I put it in the lockpicker history. The wax pad attack against uh, the, as I was talking about before, the warded locks. Basically, a warded lock is, uh, think about you know, what you would imagine a skeleton key would be. Uh, the reason that it passes through the lock is because those dodgy cuts in it, the square, crazy looking pirate keys, uh, they're passing by metal wards. And as they pass by, they turn a cam and the lock opens. So what you would do is you would take a blank one of those, you put a little piece of wax on it, and you turn it, and you hit one. You take the lock, you take the key out, and you see the mark that it just left in the wax. You file that down, you file it down into the key, you go again until you hit the next one. And this very simple, very, uh, just very iterative step-by-step -step process could defeat a gross number of locks, hence the advent of some of the puzzle locks. Uh, also, the similarity of warded keys was a big problem, and uh, a lot of early lock pickers would simply try to see if their key worked in another lock. Uh, nowadays, key differs are such that though this does occasionally happen, it's obviously not a you know reliable technique. All right, now we're going to talk about Brahma versus Hobbes, and uh, I'm going to get to read something really theatrically, and I think you'll all like it. Uh, going to zoom that a little. All right, so in, in 1851, at the Great Exhibition over in England, uh, America was America was kicking ass. Uh, we showed up and we had the best yachts, we had the best all sorts of stuff, and as it turned out, we also had the best lock picker. Uh, now, a lot of people have covered this in much more depth and much better than I could. There could be a whole talk on this. It's uh, honestly a very cool story, but there's some controversy. Uh, the fact is he took many, many, many days, a couple of weeks in order to do this, and the common thinking is that he was not supervised during the entire time, as it would simply be boring to watch him. Sorry. Uh, so, there is still controversy today. Even recently I was reading an article where somebody had uh, pulled apart the lock and insisted that he damaged it in the course of doing it. Uh, I have no personal opinion. My favorite part is the media coverage and our reading. The Battle of the Locks. America still adds to her laurels in England, in addition to making the fastest yachts, the best plows, the most serviceable reaping machines, etc., etc. She can now boast of outdoing the world in picking locks. The distinction is of somewhat questionable character. Generally, the persons who have been, who've been most expert at this business have not enjoyed in the highest degree the respect and confidence of society at large. <laughs> a man out of employment who should advertise himself as capable of picking any lock in the world would not be regarded with favor by bank directors. <laughs> President Fillmore would probably not appoint as sub-treasurer for the city of New York any man whose sole recommendation should be that no lock ever made could withstand his ingenuity. Nationally, however, and this is my favorite part, the prejudice does not seem to obtain. England seems to think just as much of us and even a little more, although we have beaten her in everything and picked her locks besides. Uh, I love this because I feel like we're finally starting to get back to a point that was established in 1851 uh, where a talented lock picker could be seen as something other than some creepy criminal. 
<laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, modern lock picking. I'm going to talk about Tool in the Netherlands, SS Dev, the German lock sport group. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Dutch Open, which I had the pleasure of attending last year, and go over that a little bit. Uh, coming to America, I'm going to talk about Tool US, which, of which I am a member, and Lock Sport International, based out of Canada. Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about DEF CON and HOPE, and as I said, I am a tool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the open organization of lock pickers. Uh, they originated from the NVHS. Uh, if any of you know Dutch, you might be able to guess what that acronym, acronym. I got no idea. Uh, it translates as the Dutch Association for Door Hardware Sport. Uh, which I like, yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, currently they have several chapters and approximately 100 members. At the time of my research on this, it was a little while back, so I apologize if current memberships aren't accurate uh, for any of the organizations I'm about to list. Uh, except my own, I probably ought to know that. Uh, they had several struggles with manufacturers when they first started out, and it was very interesting. Is when I first became involved with the organization, I didn't realize this. Uh, Tool at this point in time uh, have developed uh, as a whole and individual members within the Tool Netherlands group have established many excellent relationships with various lock firms. Uh, but in conversations with Barry Wells, the uh, head of Tool International uh, and both uh, both Tool NL and US. Uh, he made it very clear that when they first started out, they had many of the same troubles that we're having now, in that uh, the media weren't particularly receptive. The lock companies were furious that there was any form of disclosure, uh, be it responsible or otherwise. Uh, and we're in the midst of a lot of that right now. And looking to what happened with Tool in the Netherlands, I hope points a, a positive path for us. Uh, as I said, they've developed positive relationships with various groups, uh, Han Fei in particular, who I'll mention in just a moment here. Uh, as I said, some of these are group-oriented, some of these are individual members, but uh, they're doing great things over there. Uh, Han Fei, lock collector. Uh, this guy is probably the preeminent lock collector in the world, or uh, I am proud to claim him as one of our own in Tool. Uh, he has an extraordinary collection of locks. The sheer number alone uh, is absurd, but the locks that he has are gorgeous. Uh, I believe that uh, Eric Schmidl, a gentleman who's talked uh, here before and at a couple other talks, recently had the chance to photograph his collection. And if you have the opportunity, uh, I will, uh, I'll try to put something up on our website, which will link you to that. The lock collection is really absolutely gorgeous. Uh, all right, and uh, the Dutch Open. Uh, they host the Dutch Open. It's a heck of a time. I'm going to cover it in more detail in just a minute. SS Dev in Germany. Uh, started by Stefan Wernery in 1997. Uh, they were one of the first major established lock sport organizations. Um, again, a lot of my information here, uh, though it does come through Stefan, uh, they have only recently Whoop, there we go, made the English language transition. Uh, so their website information, uh, they're finally kind of in the English language. They're really starting to communicate and reach out to groups from all over the world. And they have uh, one of the most comprehensive lists of international lock sport groups available on their website. If any of you are uh, from foreign nations, and there's a very nice French gentleman trying to ask me where he could get involved, and this is a great place to, uh, to go. Uh, they have set an incredibly firm ethical foundation for the sport, and I think it was very important for our sport that the first major group to come along set that, set that down right off the bat, and I believe that most other major groups have tried to emulate it to one degree or another. Uh, we certainly have here in the U.S. Uh, they host an incredible competition in Berlin, which I unfortunately have not yet been able to attend, uh, so I will not be covering it in this talk, um, but uh, hopefully uh, some other time. They are terrifying lock pickers, absolutely terrifying. Uh, in the course of the Dutch Open, uh, I believe there were 12 rounds, uh, 12 open rounds that everybody participated in, and at least in half of those rounds, I had not managed to place my tools in the lock before a heavily accented German yelled, Olfen! And, <laughs> and they are absolutely incredible. Um, I, I believe that they actually uh, threatened Eric Michaud over here that uh, if we didn't show up to Germany to pick with them, they were going to come here and take all of our black badges. Uh, they could. <laughs> Uh, they have a large population. They've been around for quite a while now. Uh, the current numbers that I found in the course of this research, 1,000 members and approximately only 10 chapters. Uh, that's about it. Uh, they've recently proposed the lock picking Olympics. Uh, I don't know many more of the details on that. Uh, unfortunately, um, 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't know many more of the details on that. I hope that it carries off. I hope that I'll be able to attend it some year. The Dutch Open. Uh, there were 50 people who attempted it in 2006 who attempted the actual competition portion. It is both a competition and a conference. The competition is an open. It's open to anybody who can make it in there. Uh, the private conference, however, is a closed event. Whoa. So 50 people. Uh, <laughs> um, the format of the competition is a uh, round robin. You get a lock put in front of you. There's another gentleman sitting, or lady actually. There were several women participating last year. Uh, sitting across from you, you're given two locks on the table. You get seven minutes to pick it, at which point you trade locks. Seven minutes to pick the lock that your opponent just picked. The cumulative times. Uh, determine whether you get the point or your opponent gets the point. Once people reach a certain number of points, they move on into the final rounds. Uh, and, uh, and if you're not a German, you can't expect to be there. <laughs> uh, the 2007 dates have set down, been set down as around Thanksgiving time. Uh, so we'll be heading out in late November. Uh, look for reports on that all over the interwebs. A couple of pictures. Uh, these are some of the winners and some of their prizes on the left here and one of the workshops on the right. They have a SS Dev actually brings in a lot of tools and run a workshop uh, area all weekend long. Uh, they'll cut you key blinks for a euro. They'll uh, give you access to their drills. They're, uh, it's really an incredible atmosphere. All right, coming to America. Uh, tools First Chapter was established in the U.S. in 2004. Some of you may have noticed me change that date uh, as I was standing up here. Uh, Josh Neckrep, Kim Bonnet, and Devin McDormand formed Locksport International in 2005. And then Eric Mijod, Babak Javadi, Eric Schmiedel, and myself formed Tool US in 2006, uh, during and immediately after the HOPE conference in New York. Current memberships. Uh, I actually just got off the phone with Josh. He said that they have approximately 12 chapters, uh, some more active than others, and a little over 100 members at the moment. Uh, we have four active chapters in Tool. Uh, the membership between each varies, uh, anywhere between five to 10 people per chapter for the most part. There has been discussion between individuals, between the community, in, as regards to whether or not there should be divided organization in North America. Uh, the two organizations, both Locksport International and Tool, uh, though coming out with great excitement and great promise, uh, have lagged in their progression, and they have lagged in their recruitment, and et cetera, et cetera. And some people ask, if you were one organization, wouldn't that immediately up your numbers? Wouldn't that immediately give you more of a presence? Uh, personally, I'm against it, and I'm against it for the simple reason that I believe that competition is incredible. I am excited to go home and rub in Josh Neckrep's face the fact that Tool took the speed competition again this year, and I hope that someday he'll be doing the same to me. Um, I think that it'll make us better pickers. I think that it'll make us work harder if we have a uh, crosstown rival, you know? I mean, that's really all there is to it for me. As far as the differences are concerned, there aren't many. We both believe in a strong ethic. Uh, our focuses have been uh, our focus has been primarily information, primarily organization, and primarily getting people into groups, getting people picking with their friends, getting people interested and involved in the hobby. Uh, the main differences are that they're based out of Canada, we're based out of the U.S., and occasionally we have differing opinions on uh, on really minute things that people outside of our little circle probably don't really care about. Uh, as I said, my, the main motivation to keep separate is, you know, you want to root for the home team. and can't all be the home team. <laughs> uh, all right, our website, tool.us, easy enough. Make sure to put the extra O in there. And uh, locksport.com, that's Locksport International. Uh, they recently changed their name to LI from LSI, and... Uh, this is my poor approximation of their logo that they have not yet updated. Uh, so getting on to DEF CON and HOPE. Uh, 
DEFCON has the lockpicking village, uh, which I'll get into a little more detail in a moment, but uh, it has grown to the point of being kind of a con within a con. Uh, I have been shocked, absolutely shocked, at the number of people who have tricked up the stairs and tracked us down in the locksport village, uh, or in the lockpicking village. Uh, it's a fairly small room and it is constantly crowded. It is hard to get through and that is awesome. People are participating in the points competition. They're coming in for seminars. Uh, they're, they, and I mean, not for nothing, but they're wandering down a long hallway that seems like it leads to nowhere. I'm really impressed anybody's finding us. And, uh, and there are so many of you. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, in the lockpicking village, uh, there have been competitions. Uh, there have been demonstrations. There have been seminars. And the village itself is, uh, it, we have had to literally announce three times and get mean with people to get them out the door at the end of the night when we have to close up. Uh, it's such a such a big thing now, such a validating thing to go in there and have so many people genuinely interested in something that is so important to myself and the other people that are up there. It, it, uh, it, it was very strange for me as before coming to this event most people have been, you know, lockpicking. and that's kind of a weirdo. <laughs> kind of a creep, aren't you? And, uh, and I show up here and all these weirdos and creeps want to know what I do. Uh, <laughs> it was a great feeling. Uh, it's really amazing for us to be here in this space. Uh, and um, there are uh, several other conferences that feature Locksport in one respect or another. Uh, I won't go into all of them, but uh, in fact, I won't really go into any of them. Uh, pretty, much, <laughs> pretty much any hacker convention out there in America now has a place in it for uh, Locksport, for lockpicking. A lot of them have competitions now, and if nothing else, they're giving demos, they're getting people interested in the pastime, uh, and uh, it has developed out of this community. Uh, it has developed out of the hacker community, and and as such, it will always have common ties. And uh, the majority of the lockpickers you'll find out there have some Venn diagram of similar interests outside of Locksport with probably anybody in this room. Uh, it is definitely a different thing. It is definitely a, a different perspective on, on, on similar security principles. Uh, but it is so deeply entwined with the hacker community, and, and we're proud to have it. Uh, and now the LP Con, the LP Contest. Uh, I am pleased to uh, say in front of this large room of people that I won the speed contest yesterday. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been running. For, what was that? No shirts. I know. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> I, I tell you, I'm going to show up in Holland this year and I'm going to be all jazzed and all pumped and I'm going to make myself a t-shirt that says Best American Lock Picker and I'm going to cry all night long. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, they, it, it was a great competition this year uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing in general. It's, it's the, the, I mean, I, I believe that it is the biggest lock picking event in America right now. Uh, outside of the professionals, outside of Aloha, outside of locksmiths. Uh, and, uh, and I had a big section of this talk that used to be locksmiths used to know how to have fun. Uh, there, there are so many pictures of girls with like chains and padlocks around them and a bunch of old locksmiths like getting them off and saving the girl and stuff. And, and once we started doing that, they got all serious. Uh, so anyway, it's a wonderful competition. Uh, Doc has done an incredible job putting it together. Uh, it is being passed into the hands of Tool. Uh, so next year, we're going to come out and be hosting it ourselves, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to grow it. It's been an incredible event, and we're glad to have it here at DEF CON. The internet. Uh, we're going to talk about forums, YouTube, and some blogs. <laughs> Uh, the forums. Uh, this is where some of the basic building blocks of information are around. Lockpicking 101. Uh, this is where I learned. Uh, this is where I learned a great deal of what I now know, and I've been lucky to have resources off, uh, offline as well, but uh, that's where I've learned a lot. Uh, it originally started out as a fairly black hat site. It was people getting together to uh, talk about, you know, to, to break it into stuff. And not essentially, not specifically, but it's been around for a long time, and a lot has 
has changed in that time uh, dramatically. LI, Locksport International, began to develop out of this community, and they began to develop out of the constant ethical debate. Uh, there was a lot of don't ask, don't tell in the early days where someone would say, you know, uh, how do I get into this lock? I want to break into my teacher's house. And people would say, don't tell us you want to break into your teacher's house. The person would come back a week later and say, how do I get into this lock? That's all. <laughs> someone to let them know. Uh, and that was the early community. Uh, as Locksport International developed, they did begin to push that ethic. They began to debate that ethic and really, and really start to wrap their heads around whether or not there was room in a public, in an open, in a teaching atmosphere for a black hat culture. <laughs> I personally don't believe that there is. Uh, I just simply don't believe it is. These are the things that protect your children in their homes at night, and I don't think it's. I don't think it's acceptable. Uh, as a result, Lockpicking 101, which is a public site, does try to keep a strict division of material. They have an advanced section that you have to uh, apply for after a certain period of time, after a certain period of posts, after a certain period of relevant posts, et cetera, et cetera. They do share the information liberally once you can get through those basic building blocks. And they are basic. If you're not a jackass, you're going to be able to get in if you wait a little while and you learn a little bit in the process. Uh, they're not trying to keep it out of the public sector. What they're trying to do is make sure that the people learning about it and the people sharing information are going to be serious about it and relatively responsible. Uh, so, then came along easypicking.com. Easypicking.com, <laughs> sorry, uh, someone in the audience. Uh, easypicking.com uh, started off literally against LP 101. Uh, I was ha very well advised not to get into internet drama, so I won't. Uh, they have no division of material, which I absolutely believe has its place. Uh, they will put any information that they find out there immediately. Uh, however, um, no offense to the guys over at EZP, there is limited talent there. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very good at what they do who want their information in a closed community, who want to be able to talk with people who aren't going to, you know, lols, that's so awesome, you know. Uh, they, as a result, they they don't have the top tier pickers participating over there, and uh, I'm not sure if they'll. I'm not sure if they'll pick them up. Bumkey specific forums. They have very limited information. Very, it's a fairly limited topic, though there's some things to go into, and hopefully they're becoming obsolete uh, as people are moving into bump proof solutions. YouTube. Lockpicking is absolutely a visual sport, and videos can be a great learning aid. Uh, it can be a very convenient teaching tool, especially if you're someone who doesn't have opportunity to be in a sport group, you don't have one anywhere near you, you don't have a bunch of people that you can pick with who've been doing it for various lengths of time. Being able to go around YouTube and get some information from that and see what people are doing is fantastic. That said, YouTube allows one ignorant person to propagate that ignorance at will. Uh, I'm sure that you see this in, in every field, uh, but it is particularly true in lock sport. Um, a lot of people don't even know why their lock is opened. They just shove some tools into it and they're like, yeah. And they're like, there, my, you know, got my locker off, or my friend's locker. Uh, and there's a lot of sketchy people out there. We're half of them. <laughs> Uh, they're giving us a bad name. I mean, honestly, they're just giving us a bad name. And I discovered uh, in the process of trying to grab some videos for this that YouTube actually has been going through and cleaning up some of the sketchiest uh, videos that I was hoping to show you today, uh, which is a very good thing for us as a community. Uh, I won't make any statement about whether or not they should be taking people's crap off their website. I don't really care. Uh, but having less of that out there is better for our image. Uh, this is a gentleman who is absolutely using the wrong terminology and he's using his uh, tool completely incorrectly. Oh, I probably forgot to put the audio feed in. I, I can hear it here. I'll tell you what's happening. <laughs> uh, so he talks at one point about this uh, being a... Yes, sir. Oh, excellent. He doesn't start. He doesn't start acting like a jackass till just a minute here. Oh, show me the lock is locked again, please. All right, not getting in. No. 
All right, now, what's the technique you're using here? Okay, I'm just going to basically thread in my tension bar okay. into the what would be the bottom of the lock. Do you see that? Is actually upside down. Nice. Um, and then all I'm going to do is basically apply pressure in the way that uh, the key would, the, in the direction that the key would be in there. Okay. Um, and then I'm just basically just going to put in my actual lock pick here and just go along the tumblers along the bottom all the way to the back, work it forward. And your hope. Well, at least he has that. Uh, I just, just seeing him use that tension wrench is shocking. Uh, for any of you who haven't picked yet, uh, he literally just, literally just put the wrong end in. Uh, absolutely shocking. Uh, that said, there is, however, uh, the, you know, the dichotomy. This is an incredible lock that I, I, not many English-speaking people were ever going to get you the chance to see. And have a look at this. ツーベルトリータンブラーとロッキングバー方式を組み合わせた大セキュリティシリンダーです。ツーベルコードのタンブラーは十一列。ディスクスタイルは十一列。ディスクスタイルは十一列。ディスクスタイルは十一列。ディ
Manufacturers still insist on this. They still insist on secrecy over security. There are some who've come a long way, uh, but pr primarily here in North America, they are uh, absolutely closed lip. Um, there was a great quote from someone at the Schlage Corporation uh, in the process of a Wall Street Journal article where he said, I wish these lock pickers could just be more like the magician's community and keep these things a secret. <laughs> and it occurred to me that a magician's trick isn't going to put him in my home in the middle of the night, I hope. <laughs> so it didn't seem like a relevant uh, comparison. Uh, I do, however, believe in responsible disclosure. I believe in getting together with lock manufacturers and trying to open up the lines of communication so that they can take the steps to handle the repairs, the upgrades, whatever needs to happen with their product. It's an important step because if you go out and reveal the Adams Wright vulnerability, thousands of shopkeepers are going to get robbed. You got to put it in the manufacturer's hands first. And if they're not going to do it, then that shopkeeper needs to know what the hell is wrong. They need to know it before they get robbed. It's just, there's just that fine line where you got to provide the manufacturer the chance because they're going to be able to do it in a more discreet and a more direct way than you're going to be able to do. But eventually it has to get out to the masses. People have to be able to know what it is that's protecting them and what it is that's not. All right, our portrayal, our portrayal in the media. I'm making pretty decent time. Uh, again, the media, just like the internet, is a double-edged sword. Media and the internet are all intertwined now. If I were more savvy, I would have thought of that. Uh, talented locksmiths continue to be revered. Uh, there are articles in local papers all over the country. Uh, I uh, signed up for a couple of newspaper archive things. And there are articles all over the place about local locksmiths winning the lockpicking competition at Aloha and uh, you know detailing the course of their lives, keys to the city, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, while we are just something to be worried about. Um, it's frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating. Uh, just because you're not a professional doesn't mean you're not a. Doesn't mean that you are a jerk. You know, it doesn't mean that you're some very awful man. Wired magazine, however, went in the other direction. They showed up at the Ducks Open uh, quite a while back, and they portrayed the open and they portrayed uh, the Othamaista uh, in such a heroic, such a, uh, such a, such a warrior-like role of, uh, of accomplishing this great task and being revered by their community and having, being able to pick a lock be something to be proud of, that you have a talent and uh, it was very cool, absolutely cool. The Wall Street Journal. Uh-oh, <laughs> who's that handsome guy? Uh, they covered us a little while back. Front page news, we were above the fold. And they covered it uh, from a very, very open perspective. They, they got both sides of it. As I said, the Schlage Corporation with their commentary. Uh, but they didn't villainize us whatsoever. They, they gave us as much page space as anybody that was saying something against us for us to basically say, we're having a good time, and we've got a great hobby going here, and I think we can actually accomplish something in the course of it. Uh, the top of the page, the byline read, uh, police are not amused. Uh, <laughs> to which my father said, but when are police amused? <laughs> Uh, local news. Local news is some of the worst for the most part. Uh, they find a story and they can scare someone with it and someone's going to watch the 11 o'clock news. Uh, hackers obviously know this. So a lot of people in, in counterculture uh, cultures know this. Uh, it's the same for us, uh, especially with the bumping phenomenon. Um, bumping, it's just, the bumping is just so stupid. It's so... It's, it's not that bumping itself is stupid. It's stupid that there was this flaw that has been known about forever, for so long. And it's just now finally getting to get some news. And the way most of the information gets out there is trying to scare the crap out of people. And that sucks. Yeah, no, and it, yeah, exactly. It, it's still, it, it continues. Uh, I actually do have a product here that I'm going to talk about in a second, which uh, I believe has come a long way. Um, uh, competition, however, between these media vendors is great for us. The Wall Street Journal, the reason that they're writing the article is because there's a lot of interest in it. That interest at the moment 
is fairly concerned, is fairly scared, worried about their you know, personal lives. Whereas the Wall Street Journal then needs to go in a different direction with it. Media wants to be innovative. And as long as they want to compete with each other, we're going to get the good articles out there. We're going to get the media outlets that want to be the ones to say, hey, everybody's been doing this wrong but us. And, uh, and in those situations, it's going to work out nicely for us. We're, we're going to be turning the tide. Lock design, and I'm going to address uh, the continuing problem with bumping here in a second. Uh, the European locked groups uh, actually do have some very positive relationships, as I mentioned before. They will actually send their product out to be tested by lock sport groups. Uh, you can engineer something and you can put it together and an outsider can have such a different perspective and, and such a different mindset that it will reveal something that you didn't initially come up with. It's, it's used in so many different manufacturing processes to have different people look at the same problem. And we are such different people. We're not the ones making the locks. Yeah, well, and we're different in general. Uh, <laughs> but um, but it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great habit over there, and it's led to some very good things. Uh, I'm going to talk really quickly about uh, the, uh, released under the Wiser brand in Canada and released under the Quickset brand here in America. Uh, this is the Quickset Smart Key. I took a cab out to Home Depot yesterday morning to see if they were there. I bought this for $20. It's just a little key and knob lock, but that is, the that is at the consumer price point. This is aimed at home consumers, and it is bump proof. 100% bump proof. It uses a different locking mechanism. It uses a different technology that is impossible to be bumped. It simply does not work. It has its problems. It has a, a very serious problem uh, related to uh, destructive tactics. I obviously will not go into it at the moment. Um, but as someone pointed out in the speaker green room, glass also has a pretty specific <laughs> destructive entry vulnerability. Uh, the problem with bumping is that it allows for crimes of convenience and crimes of curiosity. If someone wants to break into your house to steal your stereo, to steal your laptop, whatever, they'll get in however the hell they want. They'll, they'll continue to work until they get in, get what they want, and get out. People with a bump key make one in their, be in their bedroom, say, I don't want to, you know, I tried it out on my house and that was kind of boring. I'm going to go over to his house and see if I can't get in there too. And that's maybe innocent enough, but I don't want someone walking into my house. I, I, I don't want anyone to. Uh, so the problem with bumping is not that it is going to be the next tool of the criminal underground. It's the problem that anybody can get into anybody else's place, and that's not cool. Ah, the American bypass. Um, the American lock company screwed up, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, American brand locks. Uh, this is a bypass tool for their locks. Basically, this needs to thread itself into the back of the cylinder. It does its job, and it pops the shackle. It bypasses it. You don't have to do any picking at all. Uh, they were made aware of the problem. They came up with a solution to the problem. They put a small metal disc in the way. The metal disc was so flimsy that you shove a tiny screwdriver in there, you break it, and then you go and use your tool anyway. <laughs> it was... The, I absolutely believe that they made a very serious mistake. It continues to be a problem today. The American bypass and disc breaker tool have been out for, uh, for years, many years. Uh, and nothing has been addressed. And once the problem of being able to break their disc was revealed to them, that was it. That was the end of the conversation. Nothing has been done since. SFIC sleeve improvements. This, however, is a situation where, uh, where when made aware of what the problem was, a positive change came. Uh, this is an SFIC cylinder pulled apart. What I want you to look at is the upper right hand corner there. You see the small hole through the sleeve? That can be gripped by a particular tension tool and allow you to tension a specific part of the lock, which will then allow you to remove the core of the lock completely. Yeah, yes. Uh, modern SFIC cylinders now have a, a long groove cut there so that you can't grip it without being caught up on something else. 
is such a simple solution to a problem that was a big problem. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, there have been a staggering number of recent simple but very important advances, and I think that shows an obvious influence of the Locksport community on our modern physical security. Uh, we are hoping that we'll start developing some stateside relationships with, uh, with lock manufacturers and maybe try to get some of these things out of the way before they make it to market. All right. How am I doing on time? Doing okay. My last word on the subject. Why do we do it? Um, a lot of people involved in lock picking, involved in the hobby of lock sport, have uh, had to experience a phenomenon often known to only small fringes of the uh, American populace. They've had to come out of the closet to their families. Uh, it's a very strange thing to say to someone, you know, when they say, well, what do you do? I say, well, I, I pick locks. Uh, <laughs> And they say, well, isn't that illegal? And they say, well, no, not, not the way I do it. Uh, <laughs> and it's very awkward, and it leads to, uh, it can lead to some very strained relationships. Uh, um, myself, for the most part, my family took it very well. My friends took it very well. I had one family member who has not spoken to me other than pleasantries since she found out. It's just such a weird thing to her. As far as she's concerned, and I'm sure this is what she passes along, one of her favorite family members is now a, you know, an ardent, excited, proud criminal, uh, and I, and I I'm sure that the that the hacker community can feel our pain in that. Uh, I'm sure it's a very strange thing to, you know, help your mom set up her computer, and you know, she says, so could you, could you do bad things to me? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, why we do it? Why we do it anyway? Why, why it's such an important thing to us? Uh, there are a lot of professionals in the Locksport community, and they get a lot of crap for it. Uh, I know a gentleman who has had his entire business basically destroyed because other locksmiths are so infuriated that he's involved in the community that they've cut off the supply, they've cut off his suppliers. Thank you. Uh, they've cut off his suppliers, they've tried to cut off his business, etc., etc. Uh, it's hard for a professional to be really publicly, personally active in the community, but there are a lot of them out there that are sharing incredible information and a lot of others who are doing it to keep up. Because there's innovation on both sides of the fence, and if they're the first ones finding out about it, then they can be a better locksmith. All right. Uh, a lot of people are in related fields. A lot of people who are into computer security want to know more about physical security. Uh, I'm in physical security and I know so little and want to know so much more about computer security. Um, puzzles. Uh, one of the great quotes that came out of some of the early stuff we were doing here uh, was, it's like picking a Rubik's Cube in the dark. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very much about a puzzle for a lot of people. It's, it's a convenient thing that you can carry on a train with you. Uh, I pick down at my local bar uh, with a couple of my friends there in the audience. Uh, it's, it can be a very wonderful social thing and, and when you get it open it's really an incredible feeling. You, it's such a... I, I feel like Putting a, putting a puzzle together, a jigsaw puzzle together, and you put that last piece in, that sucks compared. That sucks. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, the security evangelists, some of them love Locksport, some of them hate it. The security evangelists in the Locksport field, uh, they want to convert everyone. They, they want everybody to be, you know, full disclosure, pushing it all out there. And I worry that the common hobbyist, the person who's just interested in the lock, kind of gets left behind. And I occasionally get worried that the security evangelist is the primary face that's on Locksport right now. Um, and I think that it would be a very good thing for people to realize and I think the Wall Street Journal did a very good job of this, that it's parents and their kids, it's people down at their local bar, it's a couple of friends getting together and picking some locks. There are a lot of normal people who don't really care about a lot of the politic of it who just love opening locks. And uh, I think that would be a good face for people to see on the, on the subject. Uh, also, it's a young field. A lot of people are getting into it because you can come in on the ground floor. I swear to God, a year and several weeks ago, I did not know that there were two separate pins in each chamber in a lock. I learned how to pick locks at last year's Hope Conference. And Barry Wells pulled me aside afterwards, and after I thanked him, and he said, uh, you're going to be on my board of directors. 
<laughs> so here I am now. Uh, a year later, he made me commit to it, and I sure am glad that I did. Uh, it's a young field. You can get in on the ground floor. You can start now and, and create a big wave in the community. Uh, it is constant challenges. New products are coming out all the time. You're finding old things. There's a great collector community. Um, and, uh, one, and I actually just covered this. The hobbyist ideal for me is the person who's just so genuinely interested in Locksport, in opening that lock, in maybe collecting some locks, in figuring out how they work. And, uh, and I'd love to have that ideal better publicized. I, I'd, I'd love that, that face to start to be put on the Locksport. I think I'm done. Thank you all very much. I'll try to grab a table in the contest area after the Q&A, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.